Today, we welcome Dr. Stephanie Drumheller Horton, who is a lecturer of paleontology in the UT Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences. Her ongoing research centers on the evolution, ecology, and behavior of archosaurs, birds, crocodiles, and everything in between, including dinosaurs, although she typically leans more croc and less bird. In particular, she studies bone surface modifications generated under modern and experimental conditions to better understand the processes that left similar traces on bone in the fossil record. She is also working on an NSF funded project to generate physical and virtual geoscience lesson kits and distribute them at little to no cost to area K through 12 teachers in partnership with the McClung Museum and the Knox County Public Library System, a project that has only become more topical during the COVID-19 outbreak. She received her bachelor's in science from the UT Department of Earth and Planetary Sciences in 2005 and earned a PhD in geoscience from the University of Iowa in 2012, studying crocodilian bite marks in modern and fossil settings. If you'd like to get in touch with Stephanie, you can find her on social media at Ugly Fossils. Again, that's at Ugly Fossils. Today, she joins us for The Silence of the Allosaurs, Cannibalism Among Late Jurassic Dinosaurs. So thank you for that welcome. Um, again, no, no crocs today, which is a little unusual for me, but we are going to be talking about a, a really fun study that I've been working on in a site in Colorado, looking at the taphonomy of a major dinosaur bone bed there. So I guess I should explain what taphonomy is for our audience. Um, the, the fancy definition is at the top. It's essentially the transition in its entirety of the biosphere to the lithosphere, which is our way of basically saying, how did the fossils end up in the fossil record in the first place? And what are all of the things that happened to them between when the organism died and when we found it? So this can tell us an awful lot about the environments where these organisms lived, where they died, all of the geological processes that affected them during preservation, and even a little bit of collector bias on the other end. How do we collect fossils and how does that affect our downstream science? There's sometimes an idea that there's just sort of one pathway to preservation. There's one way to become a fossil when in reality there are several and this can really affect the types of data that you can get out of the fossils that we find. So if an organism is buried relatively quickly, we might have a skeleton that's completely articulated, all the bones are still together. But if it's exposed at the surface for long periods of time, it might be affected by scavenging, weathering and erosion. Um, that's going to break our skeletons apart. We might be finding isolated bones. And I would say that most scientists seem to be happier with the articulated ones on the top, but I personally, as you can probably guess from my social media handle, I'm happier with the kind of messed up bones at the bottom because they contain many clues about the history of that fossil, how it got to be where we found it. So I specialize mostly in bone surface modifications, which are kind of exactly what it says on the tin. Um, there are all sorts of things that can mark up and modify, if not completely destroy, bone surfaces. So bite marks are going to be one that you're going to get to hear a fair amount about in this presentation, but plant roots can leave etching on the surfaces of bones. Trample marks, actually, so if other organisms are, are stomping on top of a carcass, that can mark them up the chemistry of the environment. So if you have a very acidic environment, you might have some etching to the surface of your bones. All of these things are going to tell us different things about the environment, what was going on when the organism died, when it was being buried, after it was buried. But the only way we can tease out that paleoecological information is if we can tell these marks apart. So I love researching this stuff um, and it's, it opens up a whole window into understanding these ancient paleo environments that we sometimes don't give credit to because we have historically preferentially collected the pretty fossils because those tend to be the most useful if you're trying to understand the anatomy of the organisms themselves. <laughs> 
a lot of my modern research is going to sound kind of familiar if you're into, say, crime scene investigation type stories, uh, because the field of taphonomy is extremely interdisciplinary. So the processes that affect an organism from when it dies until when we find it can be extremely short term and things that are uh, discussed and studied in, say, a forensic context. It's also very common in fields like archaeology, paleoanthropology, and yes, paleontology. All of this is rooted in the concept of uniformitarianism, this idea that if you want to understand things that happened in the past, you can't get in a time machine and go back and watch them. But what you can do is observe similar processes in the present. And it's not a terribly huge leap to say, okay, if it's happening now, it could have happened in the past. What types of changes do we see? So one way that you can study taphonomic alteration of bone is to go out and basically mess up modern bones and see what it looks like after that, and then take your data set and compare back to the fossil record. You can do this in a natural setting. You can just go out into the wild and see, okay, what do bones look like if you're, say, at an elephant graveyard or if you're at a whale fall? They're going to look very different because they're being exposed to different environmental conditions. But you can also do this in a controlled setting, and it's something that we're actually quite familiar with here at the University of Tennessee with the Anthropological Research Facility uh, connected to the Forensic Anthropology Program here. But this is where you take modern bones or modern remains and you intentionally subject them to different processes, controlled processes, and then observe them. So we see this in all different kinds of taphonomic research, including on the paleontological side of things. So I specifically got into all of this through wanting to study bite marks and how they can inform interpretations of diet and feeding strategy, things like that in the fossil record. So I'm working sort of at the intersection of taphonomy and this other discipline that we call ichnology. This is the study of trace fossils or preserved evidence of behavior in the fossil record. So I'm trying to pull both a taphonomic history but also sort of behavioral information out of these same bones. Crocodilians are challenging to study their diet because many of the lines of research that we would otherwise use are kind of close to us. They have ridiculously destructive digestive tracts. So gut contents under the best of circumstances are extremely rare in the fossil record. And by that, I mean, you're literally seeing the last meal this animal ate still preserved inside uh, its, its torso. But they're ridiculously rare in crocs because their stomach acids tend to destroy anything they swallow. I'm not saying they don't exist. Here's one example. But I could cite two published examples of, of gut contents in crocs off the top of my head. Same problem with coprolites. Uh, we love coprolites. These are fossilized droppings because usually organisms don't entirely digest their food. So you can crack them open and microscopically look at the inside to figure out what these things were eating. You can do things like isotopic analysis on them. But again, crop digestion is just so destructive that you wouldn't necessarily expect anything identifiable to survive. So even though we can identify the coprolites on this page as having come from a crocodiliform, and this is a, a different locality that I'm doing research with, we're not going to be able to because croc digestion just annihilated everything that would have been in there with other groups. So that kind of leaves us with bite marks. Um, Fortunately, from the anthropological side of things, there's a huge literature on understanding bite marks. How do you study them? How do they look across different vertebrate groups? How do they change depending on the dentition of the groups involved? So this is actually from a study out of our own Department of Anthropology looking at squirrel and brown rat bite marks. But the overwhelming majority of this has been done on the anthropological side of things. And frankly, we're living in the age of mammals. So most of the groups that have been studied are going to be mammalian. So if you're interested in, say, dog or any other kind of canid bite marks, you're great. There's a ton of literature out there. Great cats, bears, hyenas, rats. We have a lot of research that's been done there. But non-mammalian groups, there is very little that's been done. So the pictures that I have here, uh, that Buckland 1823, that's the oldest ever bite mark study. And I do, I do love these historical papers because you read them and we could never get away with writing the methods sections they did. So Buckland was basically saying, 
I found a bunch of bones in a cave. They look chewed on. So I took a bunch of bones to a traveling menagerie and let the hyenas chew on them. The end. Which is fantastic. But in all honesty, it's kind of what many of us do. So as a more recent study, the lower right hand picture, that's some modern Nile crocodile bite marks collected by a colleague of mine in Jackson Zhao. So I have been looking at crocodilian bite marks in a modern setting and then taking the patterns I find there and trying to look at the fossil record to see, can, do we see similar patterns? Can we positively identify croc bite marks? Or they, do they just look like anything else that bites a bone? Fortunately, we are finding some nice diagnostic traces that seem to set them apart that are tied mostly to their dentition. So most crocodiliforms have generally a conical tooth with a prominent carina, so this ridge on it. So you'll see these, these marks that reflect that, but also they're just ridiculously powerful bite force. These animals have the highest bite force recorded from any living animal out there. So I sampled across almost all of living crocodilians, so alligators, crocodiles, gharials, caimans, everybody I could get my hands on. Um, brought those bones back, cleaned them up, looked at the traces that were left behind, and also things like the fragmentation patterns. And I've been taking that data set and applying it back to the fossil record ever since. So this is an example of a cow bone that was uh, broken apart by an American alligator. And the rest of the bone was completely consumed, and this was the only piece we were able to uh, get away from the animal and retain. But we do find many bite marks like this in the fossil record, and this is helping shed light on what these organisms were eating. So this is one example of a project that I came in on. I felt like I was cheating because this one has an embedded tooth in it. So it's like that, that animal, that one left this bite mark. I'm done. Um, but it, it wasn't just the embedded tooth. We also have, for example, this beautifully bisected mark. And again, that's characteristic of a tooth with a prominent carina. So here's the fossil example. Here's a modern example as a point of comparison. And these were all coming from juvenile dinosaurs from Grand Staircase Escalante. But I've also been sort of sneaking further and further away from just playing in my croc sandbox. So part of that is I've gone a little bit further down the croc family tree to things that are only distantly related to modern crocs. So what you're seeing in this image this is actually the femur or the thigh bone of an animal that would have looked like this. So we call them Rawasukians, and they would have been top predators during the Triassic. So very, very distant croc cousins. But the interesting thing about this bone, it is fragmentary, we're missing about the last third, is we have an embedded tooth and it is covered in other bite marks. So that embedded tooth, we were able to to CT scan it and figure out that it came from another top Triassic predator and another croc cousin called a phytosaur. So we're essentially seeing the top semi-aquatic predator and the top terrestrial predator having themselves a, a little bit of an argument in the Triassic. It's also fun because around that tooth we see re reaction tissue. So the animal actually survived and underwent some healing before it did finally pass away. To get even further outside of my wheelhouse, uh, you know, you always come up with excuses to try to collaborate with colleagues in your department. So Dr. Colin Sumrall from EPS brought me these blastoids and said, well, does this look to you what it looks like to me? And well, do we have impact trauma? Do we have punctures? Do we have a wedge that's been knocked out by that impact trauma? Yeah, I think somebody bit this blastoid. So this is a project that I'm just starting to get into and it's, it's definitely outside of my comfort zone, but that just means I'm getting to have some fun with it. And then out of my wheelhouse on the other side of things, this is an example of a nest data logger. So Crocodilians um, are not, their sex is not determined by chromosomes, it's determined by temperature inside their nests. So one type of conservation program is to put basically little monitors inside the nest to make sure you can measure the climate to see what's going on uh, in that micro environment. So I was contacted by a colleague who was doing a study related to nest conservation in American crocodiles and they kept losing data loggers and she finally found one that, as you can see, all of the electronic bits on the inside are, are not going to be salvaged. But she said, well, 
I think I know what's happening to our data loggers, but I'll have to contact a, a buddy of mine who works on this group. And yes, it does seem like the, uh, the female crocodiles were finding strange foreign objects in their nest as they were helping excavate and destroying them. So I've been having a little bit of fun getting outside of my comfort zone. So when a colleague of mine, Dr. Julia McHugh, contacted me and said, what do you think about dinosaur bite marks? Sure, I can work on dinosaur bite marks. That'll be fun. Uh, so she works at Dinosaur Journey, which is part of the Museums of Western Colorado. And they have a really interesting setup there because they have a locality called the Migat Moor Quarry that's been pretty well continuously excavated since the early 1980s. And they manage the excavations, they keep all the fossils on site in their location. They also bring in members of the public to help dig these fossils up. So many of these were not actually excavated by professional paleontologists. There were some on site directing traffic, but many of these were just visitors to the museum. And she told me, like, we have a lot of bite marks, like a lot on our bones which is a little unexpected. I'll dig into that in a little bit. But she said, we control the site. We control the collection protocols. If you could do anything with these bite marks, what would you do? And that's a dangerous question to ask a taphonomist who's interested in destroyed bones because we really want you to collect everything. And that's not usually feasible. Um, as much as we would like to, a lot of this does come down to how many people do you have that are employed who can take care of your fossils? Do you literally have shelf space to store them and care for them adequately? So usually paleontologists are having to make some snap decisions about what gets brought back and then what gets left out exposed on the surface that probably will weather and erode away and never to be seen again. But I said, all right, Julia, you asked. I want everything, every single thing you find, at least for a few years. And bless her heart, she did it. Uh, so she started putting these buckets out. And apparently the volunteers all thought this was delightful. She called them nugget buckets. But she would scatter them around the excavation site. And it did not matter how tiny or beat up or hideous the little bit of fossil bone was. It went in the nugget bucket and it was brought back to be prepared in the, uh, in the laboratories at Dinosaur Journey. So after they did a couple years of this collection, I actually got to come up and then go through every single cabinet, several thousands of bones, with two undergrads who we recruited to help us out. And we looked at quite literally every fossil that has ever come out of the Migat Moor Quarry, with the exception of teeth and a few items that were out on loan. Um, it, it was a lot. Uh, so 2,368 individual bones. And we weren't just surveying bite marks. We were looking for any type of bone surface modification. So 884 of those had something on them. So that's going to be around 37%. Of that subset, 684 had vertebrate bite marks, so almost a third. 383 had invertebrate traces of one kind or another, and then the rest were other things, so evidence of abrasion. Yes, evidence of preparation damage, because again, we are often dealing with volunteers and everybody has to learn somewhere, so lots of other fun modifications to the surfaces of bones. I'm going to talk about the invertebrate traces and then the vertebrate bite marks in this presentation. So with the invertebrate traces, we actually had several different morphs. Morphs meaning we're classifying them based on shape because we can't always necessarily correlate this with a specific actor. But we have several of these very small sort of oval boreholes we have a second set that were substantially larger, and we see modifications like this in modern bones of uh, things like pupation chambers. So you have an animal laying its eggs and then the juveniles hanging out there as they grow up. We got uh, several different morphs of feeding traces or these trails. So you can see two different flavors here along the surface of the bones, and you can see these parallel little marks where the mouth parts of these insects would have been chewing along the surface and a, a third type here. So we have a lot of diversity of invertebrate modification to the surfaces of these bones. 
What's fun with all of them is this does give us a little bit of a timeline because in modern research, looking at invertebrate modification of bone, many of these traces are not going to be formed for weeks or months after a skeleton has been laying out on the landscape. So that tells us that these remains were not being buried rapidly. And that lines up with what we know from the rest of the site taphonomy. The bones tend to be disarticulated, so the skeletons have fallen apart. They're not always in great condition. Um, so it, it works with our understanding of how this site formed. As for who the actors are, the only invertebrates that we have from the site that can be associated with any of these traces are carnivorous snails. So some of those larger boreholes, we see those being generated by carnivorous snail groups. But the rest of these traces, we actually don't have any insects known from the Migat Moor Quarry, which is within the larger Morrison Formation. And in the rest of the Morrison Formation, we don't have constituents of the rest of this fauna. But we see traces that are consistent with things like clarid beetles and tenaid moths that will actually eat into bone. We see traces that are consistent with dermestid beetles, which of any of these, anybody who works in a bone lab might be familiar with them. These are the ones that we will often keep colonies to process down our soft tissue and clean up our skeletons for education and comparative purposes later. All of these groups do date back to the Jurassic, so even though we don't have the fossils in the Morrison, we know that they were alive elsewhere in the world during this slice of time. So this is an interesting example of bone surface modifications and trace fossils revealing some of this cryptic diversity at a site. We don't expect every single group of organisms to leave behind body fossils for us to discover. Obviously, we suspect that insects should have been very diverse at this site, and especially if you have really large dinosaurian carcasses laying around on the landscape decomposing, that would certainly attract them. But without this type of evidence, we haven't really been able to talk much about that diversity at all. And that does get me around to the bite marks on these bones. Dinosaurian bite marks are historically really ridiculously rare. So if you survey museum collections from other sites, you expect to find between 0 and 4% of the bones marked with dinosaur feeding traces. If you look at mammalian assemblages on the other side of things, you have between 13 and, and 37 percent that have been marked. So there's been a, a discussion there. Do dinosaurs modify bones differently than, say, mammalian groups? Because mammals will gnaw. They will proactively go after things like the marrow cavity as a food resource. Whereas some modern non-mammalian groups, like, say, monitor lizards, are less interested in the bone and any bite marks that they leave are sort of incidental while they're targeting the soft tissue. So a bone might be swallowed, but it wasn't necessarily done uh, intentionally by these groups. So the idea here was maybe theropods weren't terribly interested in bone, maybe theropods were targeting the meat, leaving the bone alone, and any of the marks they left behind were basically accidental contact. But these numbers don't line up with what we have at the Migat Moor, and that's kind of because we've set ourselves up with this, this double-edged sword with our data set. We did bulk collection at the site for several years. Nobody does this with dinosaurs. It's just, it's too hard, the bones are too big, you don't have anywhere to store them. So we have this amazing data set where we have so many marked bones and all of these cool bone surface modifications, and we have literally nothing to compare it to. Um, these types of studies are much more common in Cenozoic paleontological sites and also in archeological assemblages. But we literally do not have a dinosaur uh, data set that we can compare it to. So we've been trying to figure out, is this normal? Is this just what a dinosaur assemblage should look like if you're doing bulk collection and you're not preferentially bringing back only the pretty bones to the lab? Or was there something weird going on at Migat Moor where these animals were having to more completely process the remains that they would under normal circumstances? because we do have a problem with trophy hunting in paleontology, especially when you're dealing with historical collections. Many of these things were collected with the idea of, we want the biggest thing or the thing with the biggest, most impressive teeth or the weirdest horns, and we want you to bring it back and put it in our museum in the 1800s. But a lot of this has persisted up to the present day. It's this type locality. You want to get a very pretty example, then you can bring it back. You 
can describe its anatomy, figure out where it fits in the tree of life and go from there. And if it's beat up and ugly, then yeah, leave it in the field because we can't store it. We don't have enough people. We don't have enough shelving space. So we have to make these calls somehow. So it's a bit of a problem when you're wanting to study the beat up bones. They're not being collected. But we do have some reason to suspect that this might be a, a real situation where Mygut Moore truly was unusual with the bite marks that we're finding and the rates of bite marks that we're finding, because it does look somewhat like environments that we see today where remains are out on the landscape for extended periods of time and predators and scavengers are sequentially visiting these remains and processing them down almost to nothing. This is what the Migat Moore quarry looks like right now with Dr. McHugh for scale in the background. Um, but back when these animals were alive, were running around the landscape, it would have looked very different. And the comparison point that we've been drawing is to watering holes in parts of the African savanna. So you would have had a very strong wet season and a dry season. So during the wet season, the water table goes up. You have these watering holes that different organisms are gonna come into to get water. The predators are gonna hang out there because that's a convenient point where prey are gonna come in to try to get water. Um, but then in the dry season, the water table drops. You don't have those watering holes or at least they shrink. So you don't have persistent standing water at the site. We don't find things like fish in the main dinosaur bearing layer here. That's also going to be a fairly stressed environment that again, looks very similar to these ephemeral watering holes. Partnered with that, other sites in the Morrison Formation tell us that we were seeing evidence of major droughts during this part of the Jurassic. We're talking about 152 million years ago. We're also seeing evidence of major forest fires. So this environment could be kind of rough sometimes. And when you see organisms going essentially through a rough patch, they'll eat anything they can find. And we are seeing evidence for that. So many of these theropod bite marks we are finding on plant eaters, but we're also finding them on each other. And some of the bite marks are being found on bones that we wouldn't necessarily correlate with a high economy region of the anatomy. When I say high economy, I mean something like a long bone in a limb where you'd expect to find lots and lots of muscle or maybe the ribs where you might have lots of viscera to eat. We're finding lots of bite marks on those bones as well, but also things like this little bone, it's called a chevron. And it basically hangs down below the vertebrae of the tail or this one, which is a personal favorite. This is a little theropod toe claw. So you would have had the keratinous sheath on top of that. This is the bone on the inside of the claw. And this right here is what we call a striated mark. So theropod teeth, unlike croc teeth, have these little serrations. They would have looked kind of like steak knives and for the same reason that you might have a, a serrated knife. They're really good for cutting through meat, but occasionally they will contact the surface of the bone and you can see each little denticle, each little bump in those striations preserved. So first of all, that's fantastic because we can now start talking about who the actor was and make some calculations based on body size to figure out who bit this thing's toe. But also that's a toe. If you're chewing on the, ins, like the, the very tippy end of these guys' toes, you're late to the party. And basically the better food is already gone. This is all that's left. So with those striated marks, we started running some calculations based off of a, a formula a colleague of mine, Dr. Dominic Diamore, has calculated that show that denticle spacing is roughly correlated with body size in these organisms. Now it's tricky because if you angle that tooth, if you're moving perfectly you know, parallel to those denticles, you're gonna get a nice reflection of their spacing. But if the tooth is moving at a bit of an angle, it's going to actually put them a little bit more closely together in that striated mark than you would see on the tooth itself. So this is always a minimum body size estimate. The other fun trick with striated marks is you would expect to find them in fewer than 5% of bite marks left by groups with this type of dentition. And we've seen that in Dr. Diamore's research with modern Komodo dragons. So remember back, you know, just to go through our numbers again, you expect to find 
four percent or or fewer of your bones in a dinosaur assemblage marked by theropods at all and then of that number you expect less than five percent to have striated marks on it but when you've got hundreds and hundreds of bite marks we actually found several striated marks fantastic the trick here is we have two known predators at the site and we have Allosaurus fragilis and we have Ceratosaurus acicornis. So again, how do we tell them apart? Comes down to body size. Many of our calculations came out in the same body size that you would expect for an adult Ceratosaur or a juvenile Allosaur. But then we got some unexpected results that were actually a bit larger than we would have expected based on those two clades. And that gets us to this mystery animal. Um, I am not going to touch the taxonomy of this thing, but some people have interpreted these remains from a different Morrison site. We do not have these at Migat Moor, but they are present in other Morrison localities as a completely separate species called Sarafaganax. Other people have said, nope, it's just a really big allosaur. Um, there are a couple other theropods that again, fall in that body size range. So what this is telling us is we have something that was at the Migat Moor that would have been this big. We just don't have it preserved there. And exactly who that was is up to some debate, partially because the theropod taxonomists are still fighting out what these things actually were. But that gets us in terms of, of the diversity of the site, that gets us back to trying to figure out who left these marks. Um, the overwhelming majority of the theropods from Migat Moor are Allosaurus. And in fact, the only Ceratosaur fossils we have are just a handful of teeth um, amongst hundreds of, of fragments of Allosaur. So we are most likely looking at the first direct evidence of cannibalism in this group, which is fun and gross and dramatic, but it's not exactly unexpected. Um, we do have evidence for cannibalism in two other groups of theropods. This one is Tyrannosaurus rex. So it looks like we have bite marks from juvenile Tyrannosaurs on adult bones. And again, many of them were on things like toe bones, and that's where this interpretation came in. It was most likely scavenging. So a juvenile T-Rex probably did not hunt down an adult and then eat nothing but its feet. And then Majungasaurus, we also have some nice direct evidence for cannibalism. We, we used to think Coelophysis was also in this uh, dubious rogues gallery, but that turned out to be a case of mistaken identity. The gut contents that were identified were later reanalyzed and we figured out it was actually a croc relative. So we smeared Coelophysis' good name. But that also means that the Allosaur bite marks are probably the oldest evidence we have for cannibalism in dinosaurs. This is one of these behaviors that's fairly common in predators today. Like many large apex predators will eat members of their own species. So it's not unexpected that they were doing it. It's unexpected that we found it, that it was actually preserved and we could find direct evidence for this in the fossil record. So I, I compare that to finding, say, dinosaurian skin. Nobody is surprised that dinosaurs had skin and everybody's surprised when we actually find nice examples of it and we can actually talk about what it looked like in the fossil record. So that's kind of fun. We actually hired paleo artist Brian Eng to reconstruct what the Migat Moor might have looked like while these bones were being deposited. So you're, you're mostly seeing allosaurs here in this picture. You have a ceratosaur because we can't fully rule it out for many of our bite marks either. And the idea here is that during the dry season, during these long periods of drought and these periods of forest fires, you have a very stressed environment where everybody is pretty much eating anything they can find. Even some of these remains that have been laying out on the landscape for a very long time, as evidenced by all of that insect information I shared a little bit earlier in the talk, um, eating everything down to their toes. So the, the least economically viable, the less sort of um, nutritious parts of the skeleton were still being heavily processed. Again, we really want to go to other sites though and try to do some of this bulk collection to see is this normal or was Migat more really you know, a stressed environment where these animals were just sort of desperately eating anything that they could. The nice thing about that is the Morrison, uh, usually when you think about famous fossil sites in the American West, you're probably thinking about a Morrison site. It's incredibly fossil rich. 
we have many, many, many uh, dinosaur bone beds that are from this slice of time. So we have started reaching out, and this is just a map of some of them within the extent of the Morrison. We have been reaching out to colleagues who are PIs at other Morrison localities, and we're trying to get a project off the ground where we basically sweet talk them into doing at least a little bit of bulk collection for us. Because our preliminary data set does show that collecting these small bone fragments does drastically inflate the number of bone surface modifications that you find. So we've been biasing our museum collections against the very things that I'm now trying to come in and study. That's unfortunate, but that's also a project for the future. So I would like to thank everybody who was on this research team, um, the institutions involved, the groups that helped us with scanning the bones for digitization. And this whole project was funded by the David B. Jones Foundation. And I would love to take any questions. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm.